Well, if you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And as you're looking up that, uh, let me just say to you that there's been a couple of films in my life that have um, struck me. Um, one is Out of Africa. Has everyone seen that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other one was The Horse Whisperer. Do you remember that one? Um, it wasn't so much the stories, actually, of the film. What, what was remarkable about those films, and I think it was by the same director, was just the magnificence of, of the filming. And, you know, the, the wide open spaces, you know, and the magnificence of, of all that was there. It just seemed to be endless, and there was so much. And, as, and the opening scenes of both of these films... It was a, a drawing a breath occasion. You know, you, you know, if you see it on the big screen, and it and it was it sort of set the scene as you were entering into the story. And I thought it was really clever the way that they they thought about that. Obviously, the director and the producers and the writers they really thought about this about how they were going to present this story so that from the word go you were drawn into this environment. And there's a number of different books out there. If you read anything about Africa, I'm very fond of Africa. Um, Wilbur Smith, certainly his earlier books on Africa, and the pictures he would draw, it gave, gave me a desire. I just wanted to go there, you know. And then uh, I read another book um, called um, From um, Cape Town to Cairo. Has anyone seen that book? Brilliant book. If you ever get to see it, I've not seen it. I've not seen it for a long time. It was the true story of a family and he was a journalist, a travel journalist, and he and his wife decided that it would be a better education for the children to take him out of school for a year. I don't think you could do that nowadays. And they would trek from Cape Town to Cairo. And it was a whole year. You know, it's all about their journey together. And that was another one of those <gasps> moments. Well, as we come to Luke chapter 1, we've got another one of those <gasps> moments because, you know, the scene, the scene is being set for us, for the incarnation, and as we enter into Advent, very appropriately. And let me just read some verses to you from verses 1 through 25. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. <gasps> yeah, you can feel it already, can't you? In the time of King Herod, this is him starting the story, telling the story, I love this bit. In the time of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well on in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will be, he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready people prepared for the Lord. Another <gasps> wonderful experience. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife's well on in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. 
Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. They realized he'd had a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months they re remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown me his favour and taken away the disgrace among my people. Luke's Gospel. Some fascinating features, and it's interesting that the nature of the letter has as its opener this greeting that actually expresses the whole purpose of the book. This is to be a full account, written in the manner of the historian, including all the details, so to give us a clear picture. It's a letter to educated people, and it's written in such a way as to, so as to grip the reader without a sense of hurrying along, but the, with a sense that the reader needed to engage fully with all that they were reading, and also to think about it. And that's what makes a really good book, isn't it? You can engage in a book, but all, automatically you're thinking about the characters, you're thinking about the plot, you're thinking about the surroundings that they're in. You see, this is not just a good story, though. It contains some of the most important facts that history has ever known. And so here is a challenge to us immediately as we come to the Word of God. This is really serious stuff, folks. It's not to be treated in any kind of offhand way, where we just pick a reading here and pick a reading there. This book and the story it contains has the potential to change our lives forever. So we must read it really carefully, but also with a whole heart, because focus, you see, is so important. Now, I was trying to think about focus, an illustration of focus, and I came up with one. Pliny the Elder, who was a, a Roman historian during the time of Jesus, um, tells of a story of an obelisk that was created. And, and I don't know if you know much of the history of obelisks, but they used to send them to a, a quarrying place, um, and a, a selected, well, they used to divine it, but they would, they would find the right rock. When the right rock was found, then it would be transported to the place where this obelisk or a statue or whatever was going to be placed, okay? And there it would reside, and the people would work on it. Once the obelisk was done, it was going to be 99 feet tall, okay? 20,000 workers were chosen to pull on ropes and pulleys and things to pull it up. That's a lot of people, okay? Quite amazing. The king was very concerned that a lot of time and effort and money had been invested in this obelisk, and he wanted the engineer to be really focused about this last piece of the operation, which was the important bit. And so he got his young son, and he had him strapped to the top of the obelisk so that he would remain focused on his job. That is what focus is about. See, the trouble in real life is that folk want something for nothing, don't they? But then we hit a wall because when it's on a plate, people are naturally suspicious. We just can't win, can we? You know the story of uh, the worker who asked for a pay rise? Alien's going to love this one. He got a note back from his supervisor. And the supervisor said, because of the fluctuating predisposition of your position's productive capacity, as juxtaposed to the standard norms, it would be momentarily injudicious to advocate your requested increment. And so the worker went to the supervisor and said, well, if this is about my pay rise, I don't get it. He said, that's absolutely right, you don't get it. <laughs> Do you know how long it took me to practice those words? <laughs> See, the teaching here is that we have to be thinkers. We mustn't give in to the standards of our society that expects everything that comes with our effort. We live in a genera we have generations now of people who have never worked, who have taught their children they don't need to work because everything is on a handout. I'm not getting political here. This is just the fact. But the fact is, we as humans have to make an effort. And that's what faith is about too. You have to work at your faith. Faith is about a relationship and you have to work at your relationship. Why do you think the divorce rate is so high? It's because people haven't learned relationship. But even though Luke's Gospel is a good read, all the way through we can see that God is in control. We can see his love for his people. We can see his compassion for them, despite all the disobedience of the generations. And we can see the reality of his presence, even in the midst of the political unrest and their struggle for identity. Because, you see, historically, this was actually a really tough time for the nation of Israel. 
suffering under the reign of King Herod. He was a vassal king put in by the Romans. He was renowned and infamous for his cruelty. And then with the Roman occupation came with the integration of many different cultures and that was imposed on their own with all the baggage of those, of those societies and cultures that come with it. That's his multiculturalism, not in a healthy sense. This, everything's imposed on them. They're being marginalised and they're being put to one side. Does that sound very familiar to us all? Then there were different religious groups with all their idol worship. And you know, the Romans were almost daily at one stage putting up different temples to some different deity with some idol because they couldn't make up their mind who they were going to worship. You know, idolatry. There was some, and I'm looking for a definition here. I was thinking of sex, shackles and stomach. That's the unholy trinity that existed then. It's the God of self that exists now. Then there's pleasure and possessions and position. And then there's something else, and this is particularly true in our society, football, the firm, that's your work, and your family. These can become idols as well. And an idol is something that takes control of your life and you allow to run your life. That is what an idol is, that takes the place of where God should be. And idol worship really is just a nonsense, you know. And it proves itself as nonsense time and time and time again because it never lasts. It's never real. It's never fulfilling. You know a story of a man called Hideyoshi? Ever heard of Hideyoshi? He was a, a warlord in Japan in the late 1500s. He commissioned a, a statue of a Buddha to be built. It took uh, 50,000 men five years to build this statue. Incredible effort, you know, people are really devoted to their idols, aren't they? Now, I know this is an extreme, but the fact is, 50,000 people. And then, in 1596, there was an earthquake, and it brought the roof of the shrine, the shrine crashing down, and it wrecked the statue. And the warlord was so mad, he went down and got his bow and arrow, and he started firing arrows at it. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with you. He said, I put you here at great expense, and you can't even look, in, look after the house I put you in. Now we laugh at these idols, but, but they can be all consuming, but they only bring disappointment. And with this climate and what was, still, what was and still is a fiercely nationalistic and, and patriotic state, there was political unrest. It was at its peak. There were many factions fighting for their own cause. There was wanton violence. Murder was commonplace. Corruption was rife and the people were suffering. Suffering. And the ones who suffered, of course, were who? They were the small people, the little people who didn't matter anymore. Ordinary folk who were trying to eke out a living. These folk had been oppressed for so long, but year after year, they persisted in following the religious rules. They persisted in going to the feasts. They persisted in going to that temple, even though God had not spoken for so long. Because they knew that God had promised to deliver them. And they knew in their history that he'd done it before. They knew he promised to do it again in the shape of the Messiah. So they went. They kept going. And I think there's a lesson there for, for people coming to church, you know. Sometimes we come year, day after day, month after month, year after year to church. And it seems that God is doing nothing. But actually, it's talking about us rediscovering and rediscovering and rediscovering that relationship with God. Sometimes we have to learn who we are now before we can go anywhere else. They knew that God could do it. And with all this backdrop, at the beginning of this gospel, we enter into the scene of the story in the routine of an old priest named Zechariah. And I, I was thinking about how I would do that. You know, how, you, how would you do that on film? How would you encapsulate all that backdrop and paint that backdrop? Clark's mind's going mad at the moment, isn't it? And, and then all of a sudden, the screen goes black for a minute and it opens up and you've got this old man in the kitchen making a cup of tea. Can you see it? Can you see it? You know? And Elizabeth's saying, so what's on this week? Oh, I've got to get to the temple this week. You know, and, and you can almost imagine coming into their kitchen. Zechariah and Elizabeth, you see, he was a devout man. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're from the line of Aaron. He was at the priestly division of Abijah, and twice a year he had to travel to Jerusalem to fulfill his office for a week of six days and two Sabbaths. Now, Aaronic priests have been divided up into 24 divisions. 
taken it in turns to serve at the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. And you remember we've talked about temple worship before, it had to continue 24 hours a day, okay? And this was a tough time to be a devout Jew. For many, God had been absent, he hadn't spoken for 400 years. And worship was so routine. And it got to the point there was little or no expectation in it. You know the kind of thing. But if there's one thing that humanity needs, it's a God who is present. And these Jews attempted in the best way they knew how to maintain contact with God and all the rituals and the rites, they're all deeply rooted in tradition. But for many it would have been just a, a going through the routine, going through the motion sort of practice. And this was important because God created us in such a way that we could never be truly satisfied in life or in anything else without his presence in relationship to us. We need that relationship with God. That's why people go. And the hunger for this reality of God, a desire to hear and speak, the anticipation that he was about to do something, it's all reflected here in these two faithful folks who were upright in the service of God. That's what the Bible tells us. One commentator says they were the picture of piety. But there was a problem, you see. Elizabeth was barren. And that was a big problem to them because it would mean their family name would die out eventually. But it also meant that the possibility of a blood link with the Messiah wasn't possible. And that was the dream of every Hebrew parent. They wanted to be the producer, the progenitor of the Messiah. Everyone had that dream, and they still do. To be childless, it meant for them the frown of God. And the blame would be laid at the foot of the woman. And so they could be excused for not being over-enthusiastic in their, in their expectation. Particularly when we consider how old they were and the pressures that life had put on them. But you know, you have to realise this. It doesn't matter how old you are, how far along the road you've come. Even the most devout can be surprised by God. And we're told in verse 39 that Zechariah and Elizabeth had lived in the hill country of Judea. And so leaving home for duty, he would lodge at the temple and spend his, time, his whole week in the inner courts of the temple that only the priests in their sacred clothing could go into. It was actually a very special time for him on his personal calendar. I suppose a bit like if you're in the army reserves, you're not going to the summer camp, you know? There was, though, one duty in particular that was fixed by law that was held in really high esteem. And that can only actually ever be performed once by any particular individual. So you were going to get a turn eventually, but it could only be performed once. And that was a task of burning incense. Now, that was presented morning and evening on a special golden altar which stood in front of the Holy of Holies. You know the big veil that covered the Holy of Holies? And so what he would do, he would come in front of the altar. The altar would be, the, the, like a brazier would be there, with coals burning. And he would come in to offer the prayers for the people. And he would take the incense that had been prepared and layer it on top, on top of the coals. And once that happened, then the clouds would, would ascend. Okay? Now these clouds represented the pray his prayers and the prayers of the people. And so he's standing in the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, where God resides in the temple, and he's the offering the prayers for the people. He's the only one that can do it once in his life. Now imagine how privileged he felt. Imagine the scene. All the worshippers in the different parts of the temple are engaged in silent prayer and in confession. Zechariah, for the first time in his life, stood alone in the holy place, watching the clouds of smoke of the incense filling the room and rising up. And as he watches these symbols of prayer, imagine his feelings, humbled at the privilege, proud in the right sense of the word to be there. He's at the apex of his experience, expecting that God is going to hear and answer his prayers. You know, Zechariah was a devout man. His desire was to serve God. He wanted to see God at work. And physically, he'd not seen a terrible lot. But then he was directed. Because, in verse 11, look at me. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Well, I don't know how you read that. I think it's absolutely fascinating the way the angel's appearance is just incidental. You know, boom. You know, Star Trek style. I don't think it was a noise of a transport or anything. It was just, he was there. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? 
You know, one of God's invisible messages became visible. And look where he's standing. He's standing at the right side of the altar of incense. This is the place of honor and dignity. Look at verse 12. Then Ze when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Well, I don't think any of us would have been any different, would we? But why do you suppose he was gripped with fear? Was he really expecting something to happen? Or was he so taken up with the privilege of being in that special place of worship? Had his time of worship become so routine that he was caught up in the, the pink and fluffy world of feelings? And so without really realising it, had lost touch with the awe and the wonder of everything. I'm not blaming him because I think I would have been exactly the same. I think it would have frightened the life out of me. But then suddenly he says to him, look, at, well, we've read the, the, the part about his son. I'm not going to read the scriptures. He says his long service, you see, all his devotion, his dreams, his disappointments, his whole life, it was all suddenly consumed in a moment. And I'm sure he pinched himself to make sure it was real. And then his mind starts rationalising everything, doesn't it? Oh, that would be great, but wait a minute, we're, we're both old. You know, Elizabeth, I don't know if she could cope with a baby. Could it really be true? And this is the logic of faith, and all of us engage in that, don't we? We start reasoning it out. Instead of just accepting God's word as it is, we start trying to work it out, and we try to get the end of everything. But sometimes there's things that we don't know, and we don't understand. We just have to accept it by faith. You see, this is a special moment in the history of the Jewish nation and for the whole of humanity. And in these few moments of the Old Testament imagery that will be so clear to him and to later readers, readers all came to the fore. This was history being fulfilled. And look what happened. A son in old age, in the tradition of the births of Isaac and Samson and Samuel. In verse 15, images of Samson. A Nazarite, he will not touch fermented drink. Well, the fact is he won't need any artificial uh, stimulant because actually the Holy Spirit's going to fill him from birth. That's pretty stimulating. And then verses 16 and 17, we've got to read those verses. Look at this. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedience of the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now this is a direct quote from Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4. And as it's quoted to this servant of God, God resumes the thread of prophecy that had come to the halt nearly 400 years ago. That's amazing stuff, isn't it? It stopped. There had been this gap and it started again. Now, God is timeless, so it was nothing to God, but for human beings. This child was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All these years. Was a measure of doubt surprising for Zechariah? I think maybe it's teaching us that sometimes we've got to escape out of time and space and history and we've got to forget that. And we have to understand that God is eternal. We have to dwell in the eternal. Well, if we're filled with the Spirit of God, we're able to do that. The trouble is we never practice it. And it's like any discipline. The trouble with doubt, you see, is that it can distract us from the truth. And it can create false perceptions that take us from, take us. From, the, from us the desire to know and to pursue the truth. And so we don't react to it. You know, I've read a lovely story of Lord Halifax. He was a, a, a former foreign secretary in, in Great Britain. And he was on a train. And it was these two very prim looking spinsters sitting in the carriage with him. And they went through a tunnel. And he kissed the back of his hand. <laughs> that is thing. Anyway, and they came out and they arrived in the station. The women are looking. And he says, he got up to leave and says, <coughs> Doffed his hat and he said, ladies, may I thank whichever one of, one of you two I'm indebted to for that charming incident in a tunnel. And then he beat a hasty retreat, leaving these two ladies glaring at each other. That's what <laughs> doubt does to you, see. There was no investigation. There was no, was it you? Was it you? It was none of that. They were looking at each other because each was blaming each other. That's what doubt does to us. It takes our eye off the ball. And this occasion for Zechariah, it was just... The new coming from the old in terms of scripture, of course, and physically too, the new fulfillment of prophecy was to be born to these faithful elderly people. Now their lives of de devotion would be absolutely complete. And so finally gathering himself, 
There must have been a hundred things he wanted to ask. And what does he say in verse 18? How can I be sure of this? <laughs> what's the catch? We always say it, don't we? So what's it going to cost? That's the other one, isn't it? Well, do you know what? If you read that in Greek, that's four words. And those four words cost him 40 weeks of silence. So be careful when you doubt the Lord. Excuse me. This is Gabriel, you see. One of two angels named in Scripture. It's Gabriel who 